so let's um, let's move on now, uh, and I can welcome Chris again, um, representing uh, Landfrica as a project, and, and uh, he's here today to talk to you all about um, about Landfrica, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about this as well. Um, Chris, I have enabled screen sharing, so you should be able to um, share your slides. And um, if you're ready to go, then I'll, I'll hand the, the microphone, so to speak, over to you um, for, for you to speak to us about Africa. Thank you very much. Let me put my presentation on. Yep. I think it's on then then me. Okay, I think I'm sharing the right screen. Um, I just want to ask how much time do I have? Just one hour just so I could plan my time accordingly. Um, the call is scheduled to end in 32 minutes. So um, you can have I don't think we've really got anything on the agenda after that. Okay. Um, I guess just, just to say to the other people on the call, if you want to add any community announcements, um, then you can do that under line 113 in the etherpad. But um, Chris, you're, you're welcome to take um, pretty much the whole of the rest of the time uh, for this session. So 30 minutes roughly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good day, everyone. My name is Chris and today I'll be talking to you about Land Freaker. Um, before I go into what Africa is doing, let me talk a bit about the problems facing African languages, some of the problems. Um, when we talk about the problems facing African languages, we talk about problems, we talk about why, when you look at the trend of um, technology, language technologies, um, advancement in, in, in languages for in the whole world, you see lots of um, work being done on English and other European languages. And on the contrary, for the 2,000 plus African languages, you see very few work being done on it. So for example, here we see that Africa occupies like 30% of the world languages. But on the right, for example, when it comes to um, research, research in a, a field called natural language processing, so when you look at the this the um the, the bar chart on the top, the blue line is English language or an European language. I'm not sure which language it is again, but the orange line is a Somali. So that's an African language. And you can see a clear a distinction as the blue line, the blue line research over the years keeps increasing when it comes to African and African languages and African languages in general, it's it's zero, very, very low. In the same way, when you look at the popular translation engines like Google Translate and the rest, you see, of course, this this um, this bar chart is not accurate now, like it's more than 13 African languages now, but you see this clear distinction. And the, the thing that we see is that African languages do not get much representation in the world. And given that there are about 2,000 of them and they occupy 30%, that seems to be a problem. And if you see it, look at the way the world keeps advancing in technologies, it constitutes a fear that very soon these languages may become extinct. So this is what we mean. This is why we say that there are problems facing African languages. Um, Okay, I will not go so much over this, but this just shows you um, if you're trying to, when it comes to, Language technologies, um, the kind of things you need, you need content creators. For example, you have Wikipedia, which has lots of Wikipedia articles and people who write on Wikipedia. I'm using English as, a, as an example. You have annotators and you have dictionaries. You have lots of dictionaries for English language, lots of keyboards. Um, for You need curators, so crawlers, language crawlers, IDs, language identification, language IDs. 
um, and tools like that. You have lots of them for English language too. And then you come to language technologists. So um, AI toolkits or preprocessors. And again, you see that you have lots of them. Um, you have so many NLT key and so many toolkits that support English language. And um, that's why it's possible to do modeling. That's why it's possible to do lots of very interesting stuff in machine translation and NLP. But when you come to African languages, many of these tools, many of these links are not there. For example, it's very hard to find keyboards or dictionaries for uh, many African languages. Um, and also you don't see so many of these translation models or these large language models having support for many African languages. Um, so that, that just shows, aims to illustrate the problem. One problem we have is what we call, what I call low language technologies. It's what I said earlier, that despite the fact that African languages are 30%, you still have very low representation in technology and research in general. The second one I call low discoverability of exist existing efforts on African languages. What you see here is there are so many um, efforts and places and, and, and repositories where, you, where there are resources for African languages. So coincidentally, or interestingly, I found that there are actually many African language resources available on the web, at least the ones that we can find on the web. But the problem is they are scattered. There's so many places where they are. So you, this is just some of the places that we've been able to find during our work at Landfrica. So there are so many more. And they're actually, let me see if I could use this. Okay, now I cannot. So there are so many, um, places where these resources are. And this is the second problem because it makes it very difficult to discover them, especially as some of these places may not be so popular. So you don't, you cannot easily find them on Google search um, like that. Or some of these places may be quite hidden. So it's not so easy to know that there are even resources there. And the third one that I have noticed during my like research um, experience and everything is there is this seems to be this kind of separation between the field of linguistics, which um, aims to understand language and, 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 and get um, linguistic knowledge about the language. And this field called natural language processing or computational linguistics or different names, but the, this field aims to try to create technologies that things using AI, ML or tools that kind of automates some of these things in, in languages or tries to create technologies for these languages. There seems to be this divide because for example, you have linguistics um, researchers not wanting or not able or not keen on using some of these tools or don't even know about them. Uh, and so the, the linguistic knowledge, the annotated data, it stays on a separate repository, like a, a different place you don't even know about. The NLP researchers don't even know about these repositories, that there is this place where you could find domain knowledge. For example, I said, I said that you cannot, there are few dictionaries for African languages, but that's wrong. There are actually so many African language dictionaries that have been uh, curated by linguists in the past. But these dictionaries are on this, like it's a whole new world. And an NLP researcher like myself, if I don't make the effort, I cannot easily find out about these linguistic knowledge that have been created. And so this divide is one of the major problems facing the progress of African languages. Because when you look at other languages like English and European languages, the European Union has made lots of concerted efforts to unite these two fields and make it very easy to link them and find joint resources that helps improve both fields. And so you have something like this, where you have African language resources, data sets, linguistic publications, publications to media, and they are all scattered in different parts of the web. And this, this makes discoverability very hard. This makes progress very hard for African languages. And so uh, one case study is take an NLP researcher, so a student who wants to work on, maybe he wants to build a model, maybe a machine translation model for an African language, and he, and he or she wants to know, or the person wants to know existing data sets or models and results for this language. So you, 
the person does not reinvent the wheel. The question is, where do you go to to find this information that you're looking for? It turns out that there isn't a place that you can go to and find everything that you want. Like there wasn't a place. Um, in the same way, we have these other case studies of general users, government officials, and the same problem, where do you go to? And so this is what Land Africa is trying to solve. Land Africa is trying to be that place that you can go to to find information about African language resources, whether it's papers or data sets, models, software. And so we're using, um, we're using a bunch of techniques to find and link various African languages. So emphasis on finding and linking. Um, and so this is what um, this is what the goal the goal looks like. So before I showed you how they were all scattered, but now with Landfreaker, they're all there's a place, a central place where you could find information on them. So information on data sets, um, linguistic publications, other publications, media coverage, um, language policy, everything concerning an African language is a central place to find them. And that's Landfreaker. So um, finding the two main categories of what Landfreaker does is finding these relevant resources and trying to link them. So for finding these resources, we partner with language repositories, we partner with data set holders, data set creators, or for example, I showed you there's so many um, places where you have this data set. So we try to partner with them and try to find uh, and try to link their re the resources that they have on Landfreaker. Um, we also implement a participatory community-led approach. So the community is invited to add res their res to link their resources on Landfreaker. And then we use uh, machine learning processes um, try to automate this. We try to improve the um, the ability of, of the machine that we're using to find relevant African language resources. Relevant African language resources, for example, are not just a paper that works on, on an African language like Igbo or Fon or Swahili. It could be a paper that's just talking about low resource languages in general with no particular African language in mind. So that's also a relevant African language resource. Um, relevant African language resources is not only NLP, it also includes linguistic works, like maybe um, some, some um, book or paper looking at the grammar of Ga language, for example. And we try to find these resources on the web online and try to link them on Africa. So for example, I showed you this, um, this before. So these are some of the resource um, locations that we've been able to find during the, our current work at Landfreaker. So we found all these many places where you could find lots of information. So you have um, on the far left, you have like places to find data set tools. So you have Saddler, for example, Zenodo, uh, GitHub, LDC, uh, Clarin. Um, then in the middle, you have um, papers um, like journals like Elsevier and Springer. And then you have open access journals like HAL. You have conference um, proceedings, places like Archive and ACL. You have Africa Archive that's trying to link and uh, open access for African language papers. So we tried, we've tried. we been able to find all these this ones for now. And there are just so many. This space is filled with so many other places um, where African language resources are housed. I'm here, I just try to show some of the key um, properties of Landfreaker, especially when you compare to other, um, what, you, what we might call competitors. Um, so for example, one, one could ask, why don't you just go on Google search and, and search what you're looking for? Why do you need a thing like Landfreaker? And the answer is, well, Google search is good and they're doing great work, but we most of the work is, is English or European language centered. So. If you're looking for a resource for English language, it's very easy to find it. But if you're looking for a resource for fun, for example, so this is a personal experience I had and part of the inspiration. If you're looking for, let's say, a data set for fun language, and you type that like fun language data set or fun machine translation or fun linguistic, there's a very high chance, like 90% probability that you won't find anything meaningful 
And why is that? That's because the places where these this phone data set might be housed is they are not popular places. They're not a popular site or popular place that, that Google has been able to crawl. And so you would get resources for maybe phone in the US or something that you don't need. And so that, that's why. So Google is not, has not been able yet to offer like a um, collect resources about an African language in a central place. And so the other, the other um, columns also show some of the things that are peculiar about land freaker. Like for example, the ability to find other language resources besides research papers, um, also trying to go into beyond the linguistic domain. So trying to also include the linguistics and the other domains. Okay, and so now our case study becomes like this, um, back to the same NLP researcher, student who wants to build NLP model for Africans and wants to know existing mod data sets or models that he can or she can or the person could use. And now where do you go to? You can go to Landfreaker, so www.landfreaker.com. So finally, we've been able to help solve this problem We've been able to solve the problem of lack of discoverability of African language resources. So let me talk a little bit into what, what Landfreaker has. Um, so just real quick, we have currently 70 plus records, 740 plus records in these amount of African languages covered. Some of the things include on Landfreaker, the records, uh, the filter. So we, we have a very um, simple UI where you can easily filter by languages filter by tasks and um, filter by the record type. So this is where we, we include papers, data sets, projects, models, software, media, language assessment, and you can also add more as new, new types come up. So it's really flexible. Using tags also allows us to link resources and, and, and tag them to specific organizations. So that's how we were able to get this information, for example, yeah, this one. Um, and what I want to highlight here in Landfreaker, the emphasis is linking. So um, most, most data set, um, it's understandable that if you're, if you're a data set creator or you're a repository, you might be scared with, are you not just duplicating this? Or like, are you not taking away my customers or stuff like that? And the answer is no. So what we are doing is called linking. We are not, um, we're not hosting data sets or we're not, we're linking. Linking means, we're telling the user, okay, if you're looking for, for this resource, so this is the title of the resource. This is a brief description of the resource. These are the African languages that the resource covers. So we, we get extract this information. And this is a link that would take you back to the original location of that resource. So at the end, we still refer users to the original locations of the resource. And this is one of the peculiar, the unique things about Landfreaker. As I mentioned before, we use the community, a community um, based approach. So the community, everyone you can contribute. So the different ways to contribute, you could um, add your record to be linked. Um, you can, if you're uh, organizing a, a workshop or an event where African languages will be involved, you could invite us to link the resources or um, you could help us partner. We, we strongly rely on partnering and partnerships because that's um, very, um, very useful for both the, the data set creators or the repositories and also for Landfreaker. We also have a Slack community where um, we can connect with other members and be part of some of the other initiatives that we are doing at Landfreaker to improve the state of African language technologies in the world. And I will briefly talk about one of such initiatives, which is called Landfreaker Talks. So it's a recent um, thing. It came out, I think, in um, June or was it July? So it, re it recently came out and basically Africa Talks is just a space to share your, your efforts, no matter how small. Um, your efforts don't have to be in NLP. It also um, includes linguistics or any other domain, um, but no matter how small. And the reason why we're doing this is because um, when you look at the news right now, you see a lot of large language models or large things from Google, Meta, and Amazon, you know, large models, big models. 
and that's good but you know it, it it's it's only big things and for for small african indigenous communities you really cannot you don't have the resources to use any of those models that's one two some of those models don't even have many african languages so they may not even have your african language and so this space is instead of talking about only the large things we also talk about the small things that you have done or you are working on or you want to work on for african languages and the aim is to create an online library of knowledge around language technologies for african low resource languages so imagine something like 50 years from now imagine 100 years from now your generation they they have like a, a gallery like maybe a youtube playlist of of, of, of resources and work that people have done for African languages and your generation could go and watch them and, and learn from them and see how to improve on them. So we, we don't want a world where 100 years from now, no one would, would know what phone language is or no one would know what our language is. So that's why we're trying to create this online library. Um, again, we're not the only ones doing that. We have also similar initiatives from Sadler and Masakani and the rest. So for example, you are free, you're free to join our upcoming talk on August 15th. We will have Manzi, Isaac, and Mugenzi talk about what they're doing for King Rwanda. And also all the talks are recorded. So it's still, the aim is to create a knowledge base. So our real audience, like I always say, it's not the, the Zoom audience, for example, it's the, the posterity. That's the real audience for these, for these, um, for these talks. And so with that, I conclude um, by saying, so it's, it's, good. it's good that we are creating efforts. So efforts like papers, writing papers, doing research, um, creating data, um, creating models. It's good we're doing all that, but that's not the only, like doing that alone will not solve the problem facing African languages. It's important to also have an easy way to access these resources. And so we propose Landfreaker as a way to access them. It bridges the barrier between African languages and also it bridges the barrier between linguistics and NLP and all other domains that work with languages. So you have NLP, you have linguistics, you have data people, you have um, service providers. So it brings all these entities together so they could easily find resources from one another. And one peculiar, peculiar um, unique of Landfreaker is cross-platform. So um, resources in one, in, on Landfreaker, you could find resources from different platforms. And this is one thing that platform-based um, efforts don't have. So if you go to one platform, you can only find resources on that platform. But with Landfreaker, you could find resources across different platforms. Okay, um, so that's it. Thank you for your attention and I can take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I have a couple of questions, one practical, I guess, and one more um, general. The practical question is, can you provide the folks on the call with the link to your Slack workspace or can they find it easily by visiting the website? I, I was trying to take notes as we went through and I've added the URL for the Lamprica homepage, but I couldn't get the Slack workspace link very easily. Okay, um, so if you go to, to the Slack website, it's it's there, it's, it's the second button. So um, okay, cool. the first button says browse our records and the second one says join our Slack. Oh yeah, I see, okay, nice. That's very easy. Um, I'll, I'll just add that into the notes for anyone who um, comes back. And so then, um, you know what, I've probably got two more questions, but I wanna give space for other people as well. Uh, the, first one that came to mind was you mentioned about the um, kind of difficulty of finding a lot of these resources through a Google search for example and that's um, I can see how that is a like a, a huge 
disadvantage and, and a disadvantage that keeps it kind of self perpetuates, I suppose, like the longer that that's the case, the worse the problem becomes as well, because Google is very good at continuing to boost the, the things that it already boosts, if you see what I mean. Um, and I wonder if I, I can see how a resource like Lamfrica is really helpful in, in these cases. Um, I wonder if there's also any um, any guidance that you can provide to those folks your partners who have those resources online themselves to work on things like soft um, search engine optimization that might help with this or whether that is simply not a thing that will work in this case because the the way that google does things stacks the odds against african languages in a way that means that um, search engine optimization is is not going to make that much of a difference anyway yeah i, I can talk on that so a lot of the, the partners that I've worked with, they do have search engine optimization. So for example, some of them have their websites on WordPress, which makes it very easy by just clicking a few buttons, you make it searchable and optimized. So they do have that. I don't think the problem is really about search engine optimization. I think the problem is about interest. So like you said, the way that Google does things, it, it's like you said, you said it very well, it's stacked against African languages because um, over the years, you do, you've not had so much interest in African languages. It's mostly English and other Af other languages. So um, you could do search engine optimization, but it's still going to be very difficult to find some of these resources. One one very useful example is um, so take take uh, an indigenous researcher. So maybe somewhere, imagine somewhere. Um, I could imagine a village in Nigeria, someone living in a village in Nigeria, and this person has been able to maybe record his grand his grandfather's poems. And this person doesn't know so much about the internet, but is able to go to a Google Drive and upload these things, and that's all he can do, and that's where it stays. So. Google Drive, you know, you cannot really find resources that are on Google Drive through this way. So that resource ends up staying on that Google Drive and just, you know, lying down there for years. So, so with this way, search engine optimization would not really help. And so with Landfreaker, all, we, all you could do is now connect, just put a link, a URL to that Google Drive, put the, the title and the abstract and then put on Landfreaker. And then you now have a way for people to now refer back to that, your resource. So we are, we're really trying to, to reach out, um, to reach the indigenous researchers of people that may not have so much um, know-how or, or skills about the internet or how to do search engine optimization or make your resource um, findable on the, on, the, on the web. Thank you, Chris. That's really interesting. Um, I see Janetta has a question. Uh, Janetta, sorry if you had your hand up before and I didn't notice. Um, I apologize no, for that. No, I've just put it up. <laughs> um, so, Chris, I was just wondering, based on what you've just said, um, I, it's um, great to have those links to uh, to these resources, but if these resources are not maintained, for instance, you mentioned Google Drive, if this person's account uh, disappears or you know he just doesn't maintain it that's that's also going to disappear what is in there uh, do you have do you make any efforts or do you think there's scope to uh, to help people actually make these things more permanent even if it's a um, like a git repository so i'm just thinking specifically of the the poems um, git itself is not not necessarily a good idea but it's a start uh, or github i mean because we've just had these things about github not being long term but at least it's a start uh, or maybe the development of some repositories that would hopefully have a longer lifetime uh, where things like this can be collected and copied into even if it's not by the originator uh, itself at least then by people who do have the know-how because I can understand not everybody has the know-how to do it. Uh, so do you perhaps have any plans for things like that? Um, yes, ma'am. That is in our 
roadmap. So using the example that I gave with the indigenous researcher, um, at Landfreaker, we do, we are making plans to do um, automatic checks of the URLs and their, where they link to, making sure that they're still alive and they're still linking, you know, correct, they're still working correctly. And so URLs that don't work correctly would kind of have like a warning for the user who's searching like this URL has a problem. And then we would reach out to the, to the, the, data, set, the data set owner, uh, the owner of that, the, the owner of the resource and try to, um, um, inform the person that your URL, you have a problem and maybe this is what, you need to do something about URL. Now for the researcher who linked his, his work on Google Drive, um, let's say the person comes to us and says, okay, I have this work on Google Drive. What we first do is we say, okay, we can definitely easily help you link this on Google Drive. That's one. Now two, do you know that there are other places like Zenodo, GitHub, or Hug and Face, or these places where you can actually put this, your data, which will make it easier. So easier, for example, um, SEO optimization, easier, for example, um, the last longer. Easier could also be that it's easier for people to use your, risk, your, your data in code. So do you know of these places? So we kind of like provide a list of options for you. Um, for the person to now choose to um, put his work there. So yes, we do have that in mind. Thank you very much. And that's also one of the advantage of the partnerships that we have with the data set owners because it, it creates this, um, you know, we, you know when, when new users come that don't know about these data set places, we can also recommend these places to you. Like, okay, you could also try putting your work in this place and all this. Or like, if you're working on a, a South African language, you could try putting your work on Saddler, for example. If you're working on a, a data set that's in TXT and it can, you could try putting on Zenodo or Hogan phrase or something like that. So it can easy, you can easily um, use that in the code or something. Thank you, Chris. That, that's really helpful. And it's good to hear. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right, we have time for maybe one more question for Chris. Ginetta, is it a new hand or is it the same hand from before? Okay. Um, Chris, I have another question then. So you mentioned about trying to build a community around this and, and making it a community led effort as well. And it seems to me that by partnering with so many organizations that have kind of overlapping or um, similar missions, you are making a great kind of community or connection between these, these projects. And I wonder if you've seen those partners with Lamfrica kind of independently or through you sharing their kind of um, knowledge and their approaches to how they do things as well so that so that they're all they're all also benefiting in a second way from being connected to Lamprica, if you see what I mean beyond the kind of findability and so on that you are providing to them directly are they also learning from each other and getting better at what they do because of that Yes, yes, definitely they are. So one example is the a partnership we, we have with Africa Archive. So it's been a very huge um, opportunity for us to learn from each other. So we learned from Africa Archive, they learned from us. For example, they learned about these, um, you know, having like a, a um, how do they call it? You know, having like a, a place where people could search for resources and you could like easily find them with filters. And we learned about how they, how they, um, you know, create this open access um, platform and learn about things like data governance, copyright, when you're dealing with data. So, yes. This is very cool. Chris, thank you very much for coming and telling us about it. Um, I may follow up with you by email because I think that there's some stuff that I can take from um, your talk and the fact that now I know more about Lamprica to include in our um, set of like um, resources to find data sets for teaching with um, that we that we share with um, with other Carpentries community members. So yeah, I'll follow up with you after the call. 
Uh, we've hit the top of the hour, so um, we're at the end of this session. Um, thank you again to uh, Chris, especially for coming here and, and talking to us about Lamfrica today. And thanks to all of you for, for coming along um, and joining the session. Thanks to anyone who's watching the recording online afterwards as well. Um, there is one community announcement in the Etherpad on line 150 about a Our Ladies um, meetup uh, looking at moving from Excel to R on the 13th of August, so in a couple of days' time. Um, you can read more about that on line 50 of the of the Etherpad. Thanks again for being here. Um, I wish you all the best for the rest of your day and the rest of the week. Thank you very much for having me. Take care.